So this is, this is a fun study in Jonah. I think all of us are familiar with Jonah. And I would, I would assume, how many of you have studied Jonah? Anybody had? Uh, okay, we've had, we have a few, at least that raise their hand. So let me open up. Um, let me open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for um, your word. And I would assume that most of us here know you. We're saved and we're here because um, we desire to know more about you. Uh, we desire to have a healthier Christian life, a healthier walk, um, a heart that uh, is more in tune to you um, than it is the things of the world. And we recognize as believers that that is a process in our lives and that it is a daily, hourly process. And so, Father, we ask you that as we open up the Word that you would move in each one of our hearts, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would um, resonate with the words of Jonah and what we learn in this very real story that happened to a man of God. And we pray that it would help us uh, uh, strengthen our lives and to prevent us from, from um, doing things that he did. Um, so, Father, we ask you to be with us in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, I'm gonna. I, I'm just changing the title right now. God's servant backsliding. God's servant backsliding. I'm writing it down right now. We're gonna look at the first three verses uh, in in Jonah. And so let's just read this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amity. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. And cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship which was going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I've mentioned to you in the past that. I was blessed to have grown up in a Christian home. I never remember my parents not taking us to church on Sunday. In fact, many of you have heard that I grew up in a Presbyterian church that we attended, uh, and there was actually a traveling Presbyterian preacher, an evangelical uh, preacher who was holding a week-long seminar, and at 10 years old, the God, uh, God saved me. And I've, I've never doubted it since. I knew that my sins had been forgiven and that God had truly saved me. I can remember sitting there with my father just saying, I have so much joy in my life. At 10 years old, I, I never doubted it. Um, and then we were part of a group that started a PCA church in our hometown. From then on, I was privileged to sit under great teaching and preaching. I was introduced to sound expositor, expository preaching. Um, I was given wonderful books on doctrine and theology. I was exposed to the Westminster Confession of Faith when I was in my young teens. Uh, my parents opened up our home every spring and every fall to a man named Don Anderson, who was a graduate of Dallas Seminary. He was a traveling teacher. He would come and teach every week uh, through sections of the Bible. And um, he was a great teacher. And we'd have, I don't know, almost 100 people in our home uh, with just fantastic teaching. I've mentioned to you, again, in high school, I got to be great friends with Tommy Nelson as he drove over uh, to our FCA group and helped me spiritually and helped us. I was uh, taught to memorize and meditate the Bible. Uh, my father led the family as a godly Christian man. I had Christian friends. I had a Christian family. I was given access to biblical and theological teachings. In short, I was spiritually privileged. I was. And when I got to Baylor, I never wavered from my faith, but I wavered in my walk. I was suddenly exposed to new worldly influences from my little hometown of Greenville, Texas to um, 
two or three thousand people my age in a big city that had more than one movie theater. And I was loving it. Um, it's not that I was bad or the things I did was bad in and of themselves, but my emphasis drifted to more worldly things than godly things. As a matter of fact, my dad accused me of getting the three G's mixed up in my life, golf, girls, and grades, and, and it was true. Um, I dated girls uh, that were not considered bad girls. They were considered good girls, but they were a negative influence on me. And although I um, love the Lord, uh, I would say I drifted in my Christian life. I ignored the counsel of my father. I went through the motions, reading my Bible and attending church on Sundays, but deep down in my heart, I had drifted from the Lord and was drifting from the Lord. My love grew more for the world than it did for the Lord. By all outward appearances, though, my Christian faith was strong. But inwardly, my heart had become cold to the Lord, and I had really backslidden for a time in my Christian life. And it is amazing how that can happen. And I look back on my life and the subtle influences of just drifting and going after the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life and my own desires and yet outwardly looking like I was a strong Christian and walking with the Lord. And the reason I'm telling you this story is this is really where Jonah started out. And, and it's absolutely fascinating because I want us to understand, a lot of us don't really understand the background of who Jonah was. And Sinclair Ferguson makes this point. It's a great observation that he had great spiritual privilege early on. It was rare. He had a rare pedigree of godly influence but he backslides in his Christian life. And I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter 14. While you're doing that, I'm going to get a sip of coffee here. Now there's a section here in 2 Kings chapter 14 verses 23 through 27. And I just want to sum it up. I'm not going to read it. We're going to read one verse. And it speaks about King Jeroboam II. He's reigning. He's reigning over Israel and he's wicked. And Jeroboam II, he persists in the disobedience of his father who was King Jeroboam, obviously the first. So King Jeroboam continues to promote this disobedience and idolatry all throughout Israel they're, they're loving and worshiping golden calves just like their father did. So Israel is living in disobedience. And God sends a prophet to speak in the middle of this, and it's Jonah. And he's telling them, despite your evil ways, we're going to recover a lot of the land that you lost. And notice now in verse 25, he... King Jeroboam II restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the sea, if, as far as the sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, listen, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amiti, the prophet. And so look. Right here we see God had sent Jonah to encourage the nation of Israel and provide assurance to them that he was still with them. And Sinclair Ferguson makes the point. He says there's three unique spiritual privileges that we can see out of this that Jonah had been blessed with. And we don't need to miss this because it's going to help us understand where he backslid from and what he had. Look, number one, he was privileged to be a servant. Do you see what it says there? He was a servant. Is that thunder? Is somebody on the roof? That's interesting. Yeah, ambient noise. All right, look at number one. He was, notice this word servant in front of Jonah. He'd been set apart by God. 
uh, for spiritual service. Uh, the Old Testament speaks about prophets, so they were privileged servants of God. God. God uses these prophets to reveal His will. They had special insight given to them directly from God, and they were then to take this insight that God gives them directly, this divine insight, and talk to the people about it and give them God's Word. And so, and so their message, these prophets' message, his servant, this Jonah, uh, as a servant of God, they were mouthpieces of God. So they had a privilege of being uniquely used by God. And so that's who Jonah was, number one. Number two, not only did he have a privileged spiritual upbringing as being a servant, but he also had the privilege to proclaim God's purposes. The nation of Israel had lost their way. Uh, God had raised up, it had been 400 years, prophets like Elijah and Elisha. And interestingly, Jonah was during the time of Elijah and Elisha. And, and they were to bring God's truth back to this fallen, uh, dead, dark uh, apostasy in Israel. And so Jonah's life was, was motivated to proclaim God's true purpose. He knew God's will, and he was to give it to the Israelites. He was God's man. He was God's servant. He was God's prophet. He had the privilege then of being called by God not only to be his servant, but to proclaim God's purposes. And lastly, number three, he had the privilege to enjoy Christian fellowship. That's really interesting up there. So Sinclair Ferguson points out that the earlier references to the sons of the prophets, there's seven verses in 2 Kings. I'm not even going to name it. it. talks about sons of the prophets, sons of the prophets, sons of the prophets. Those were students of the older prophets. And Ferguson makes the point that Jonah most likely was a student of Elijah and Elisha. Matter of fact, I read this is interesting. They said that Jonah could have been born, it's Jewish legend, from the widow of Zarephath when Elijah raised them from the dead. So anyway, it's really interesting what's going up on the roof. <laughs> um, so think about this. Um, Jonah is a servant of God called directly by him. He's uniquely positioned to give the word out to everybody. And then as he was a young guy, uh, he had this influence of these other prophets on his life. I mean, it was like he sat at the feet of John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and Steve Lawson his whole life. And so he had unique, special spiritual blessings and privileges. It's incredible. So he, he, he was a man that had great influence early on in his life. He'd been blessed more than most. But regardless of this, he backslides. He fails. He fails miserably. And we open up the chapter and we find Jonah on his way down in his Christian life. How many of us have give, been given spiritual privileges way beyond what we deserve and we find ourselves wasting them? That's the story. That's the story of Jonah. And Sinclair Ferguson makes this point. He says, great blessings often uh, only bring, listen to this, great blessings only bring present faithfulness when we continue to be obedient. Great blessings only bring present fruitfulness when they are met with continuing obedience. I think I read that wrong. So here's the, here's the point. Listen to this. No past privileges in your life, nor all past privileges together in your Christian life, nor past obedience, nor fruitfulness in service can ever substitute, here's the point, for present obedience of the Word of God. Now it's interesting, isn't it? So no matter what God has done in your life, no matter all the blessings that He has poured in your life in the past, that's not what matters. 
What matters is, are we walking with God in obedience now? And that's the point of Jonah. All of us need to, to think about this. Are we living, are we living with past obedience in our life? Or are you living with current obedience in your life? That's the problem with Jonah. He looked and said, I'm spiritually blessed. I had all this from my childhood. I was chosen. I had godly parents. I had godly influence. I was, I was number one in my spiritual class. But that doesn't matter. What matters is where we are today. Are we currently walking with the Lord in obedience? And that's a concern, isn't it? Because we would think in our own minds, if I had all this spiritual privilege, if I had been given all these things in, as a child in my Christian life or whenever, then, then I would just continue on being super Christian and obedient. And Jonah is a picture for us to say, no, that's not the case. What are you doing for the Lord right now? Are you obedient right now? Are you serving Him and submitting to His will right now? Are we dwelling on the past spiritual accomplishments and neglecting the here and now? Are we too anchored in the past and oblivious to today what God wants us to do? And that's a dangerous mistake. And it's easy to say. That's really where I was at Baylor. Hey, I grew up in a Christian family. Hey, I had all this influence. I always read my Bible. I knew theology. I knew all this stuff. But I had left being obedient with God day to day. And so I, I want us to go through these three verses here. Number one, God's Word was known. That's how we're going to look at it, verse 1. And hopefully this is going to prevent this, these things from happening to us. Number two, God's Word was commanded in verse 2. And finally, God's Word was ignored. All right, so let's see, what did Jonah do? How did he slip off so easily? So the Word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amity, saying, So, Jonah, Jonah, can you hear me? Where does the word come from? Where does the word come from? Look, look what it says. It comes from the Lord. And this word uh, is Yahweh. And Yahweh is who? The great I Am. Remember Moses, uh, he was at the burning bush and he was talking to the Lord and he said, Who are you? And that's when God said, I am who I am. In other words, I will be who I will be. I am the absolute. I am the absolute being. Again, Yahweh is also the Son of God. I am who I am is the one who governs and creates the world. I, I, I am the self-existent. I am the self-sufficient. I depend on no one. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of my people. I am the Lord. I am the God. And so think about it. Jonah gets the direct word from God, from I am, directly. Now, it's interesting. This, this, this word of the Lord is mentioned over a hundred times in, in the books of both the major and minor prophets. And it is a word that comes directly from the living God. It's when God sends his word out and it can't be stopped. Now think about this. Anytime God gives his word, we know it doesn't return void. So God sends his word out and it doesn't die in the ground. It never returns void. It's always effective. So here is Jonah getting this word from God. He hears it and he knows it. And it comes to him. Now, Jonah already knew. We already found out. He grew up in a Christian family. He grew up under the most godly influence anybody could grow up. So he knows God's Word. It captivates his thoughts. It influences him. He knows it's truth. It's crystal clear. It's not ambiguous. It's straightforward. And one way I said the other night, the way that we know we can be saved is, is this Bible resonates in our life. We can read a lot of books, and we can even read this as a book, but it won't really mean anything to you until you're truly saved. And it meant something to Jonah. It was clearly, it was clearly God's Word to him. Now, I can say in a group this big, there could be people in here that, that are going through the motions. 
but the word really doesn't resonate with your heart. That means you really don't know God. That means that you haven't had a saving relationship with Him and you need to stop and consider that. And as Steve says, do business with God. But Jonah knew God. Jonah knew exactly who God was. And he knew that God's word was God's word and it was clear and unambiguous and it had come to him. So it wasn't beyond his misunderstanding. Uh, it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't like he didn't know exactly. It wasn't fuzzy. From God's mouth to Jonah's ears, there was no confusion. There was no misunderstanding, no ambiguity. God spoke to him and he said to him clearly what he needed to hear. Okay, number one, so God's word was known. No, there was no fumble. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. Number two, God's word is commanded. So here's what he says. He says, I want you, Jonah, to arise and go to Nineveh to the great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. So Jonah was commanded to go and cry against Nineveh. Simply put, he was to go and preach. He was to go and preach. That's what he was called to do after all. He was a prophet. Now let me tell you a little about, a bit about Nineveh. You've probably heard about Nineveh. Ancient Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire in the 7th century and the Assyrians were enemies of Israel. Ancient Nineveh was 500 miles northeast of Israel. Uh, it was located on the Tigris River in present day Iraq and get this, it had the population, archaeologists assume, of about 600,000 people. It took three days to walk across Nineveh it was about 55 miles. It was known for these incredible, impressive walls, some 100 feet tall. They were so big, it was said that chariots could race on top of them. It was a magnificent city, palaces, temples, bustling market. Now, to give you context, Israel is here, and they're sensing their storm clouds brewing. And to the north, it is Assy uh, uh, Assyria. And to the west, it was Egypt. And just like modern day Israel, there was war around Israel. And the enemies were gearing up. And they knew this. They wanted to get rid of Israel, just like the enemies do today. And so that's the context. Um, Israel was well aware. They knew the sense of anger with their neighbors, they knew the plans. And so the Assyrians wanted to control Israel. They were sworn known enemies. Now let me give you this little background of the Assyrians a little bit more. Um, one commentator wrote this. I'll read it. The Assyrians worshipped the vicious god Ashur and a multitude of other gods and goddesses. The Assyrian wickedness, you see that God noticed their wickedness was legendary because of their brutality and their cruelty. The Assyrians were known to impale their enemies on stakes in front of their towns and hang their heads from trees in the king's gardens. They also tortured their captives, men, women, or children, by hacking off noses, ears, fingers, gouging out their eyes, tearing off their lips and hands. They reportedly covered the city wall with the skins of their victims. Rebellious subjects would be massacred by the hundreds, sometimes burned at the stake. Then their skulls would be placed in great piles by the roadside as warning to their enemies. Their brutality was common. It was well known. For example, after they'd conquered their enemy, they would determine a leader. They would grab the leaders. They would torture them to death in front of everyone to send a message. For example, they would take them tied up. They would reach down their throat and pull out their tongue in front of everybody. Horrible brutality. They were known for filleting people alive. They'd frequently take a man, stretch him out between the stakes with his arms and legs, then peel his skin off while he was still alive. And then they'd hang the skins again outside the city wall to instill fear and display 
their power. Their war atrocities were legendary, and, and we still talk about them. So we can imagine how Jonah felt, can't we? Uh, uh, think about this. The word comes to Jonah, just like maybe coming to Benjamin Netanyahu and saying, all right, I want you to get over and get in your car and drive over to the Hamas and sit down and forgive and forget what you've done to us. So that's kind of the sense. That's what, that's what, that's what Jonah is feeling. He's feeling confusion. So then the question is, what was Jonah's reason for disobeying? Why would Jonah not do what God's Word clearly told him to do? After all, he'd grown up being taught to obey God's Word. He'd, been, he'd grown up being taught most likely by Elijah and Elisha and the other prophets and Amos to, to obey God immediately. So what is his reason? Well, maybe because it was going to be scary and difficult. Maybe it was because it was taking him out of his comfort zone. Uh, could one man make a difference in 600,000 people? Uh, uh, maybe he was fearful of, of being killed or being ridiculed. But really, was it fear? What was it fear? Maybe part of it. I'm not sure if Jonah was that fearful. Do you remember... Think ahead in the story when he told the sailors to throw him overboard in the sea. He apparently wasn't fearful of dying. He was pretty tough about that. So really, maybe we find why Jonah was disobedient by looking ahead in chapter 4, verse 2. After he had preached to Jonah and God had brought revival and spared them, here's what he says. You got it right there? Chapter uh, 4, verse 2. Then he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish, since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster. So Jonah's main reason for his rebellion is that he didn't want the people to repent and be blessed by God. It was okay if God blessed Israel. It was okay if God blessed His people. But Jonah could not see and did not agree with God's idea to bless his enemy. Jonah probably thought, if that happens, then my people are going to come to me and say, who are you? You're a traitor. You're part of, of bringing our enemies to faith and getting to know our God. And so I think this test in Jonah's life was hitting him right where it counted. Was he going to obey God and was he going to do whatever God told him to do when it mattered most with his people? His people, Israel, who he loved, who he was called. So you have the you have the great prophet who is unique and set apart being called to go share God's gospel to salvation to his enemies, and he didn't want to do that. He didn't agree with it. He didn't agree with it. And I think his pride as a prophet and his pride as being part of God's people caused him to stumble because he couldn't connect what God was asking him to do and what he thought was right in his own heart. He didn't want to sacrifice his own reputation for the sake of these Assyrians. He just couldn't accept it. He simply didn't see things the way God sees them. That's what happened. Everything in his mind reasoned differently. Have you ever been asked to do something and follow God's will and there's nothing that makes sense about it? Everything in our mind looks different. Everything we can reason looks different, and yet God says, no, I want you to do this. Think of Abraham. Lay your son on that altar and kill him. Nothing made sense. This is where Jonah was. Since he couldn't see any good reason for God's command, 
then there couldn't be any. And so Jonah doubts God. He doubts God way more than his own reasoning. And so God actually, His Word comes with the assignment. And since Jonah couldn't reason a blessing in it, and since Jonah couldn't see it in his limited view, he replaces believing God's Word with believing what he can see, with believing his own reasoning. And ladies and gentlemen, when we do that, when we start to believe our own reasoning and we ignore God's Word, that is sin. Sin boils down to one thing. I don't believe God's Word. And that's what's happening here. That's what always happens. That's what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve didn't believe God's Word. And so the message for us is we look at Jonah's mistake. He's, he's privileged. He has everything that someone can have growing up as a believer. He's willing to follow Jesus, but not if it crosses with his own reasoning and his own understanding. And then he bails. And the point to us this morning is, number one, trust God even if it doesn't make sense because God always knows best. I think of Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now what does that mean? Well, it simply means we're to die to our own reasoning. We're to die to our own understanding. We're to die to our own wishes. We're to die to our own will, to our own dreams, to our reputation. John Piper puts it this way, be willing without questioning God, without complaining in all faithfulness, be willing to be opposed, be willing to be shamed, be willing to suffer, be willing to die for everything, for all your allegiance to God. And see, that's where Jonah pulled the ripcord. Piper goes on to say, the heart of the matter is to take up your cross, which means to treasure Jesus more than treasure human approval and honor and comfort in life. Our suffering is not a tribute to Jesus unless we endure it because we cherish Jesus. Taking up our cross means Jesus has become more precious to us than approval, more precious than honor, more precious than comfort, more precious than life. And sadly, with all the spiritual privilege that Jonah had been blessed with, he couldn't go that far. He went his own way. You see, Jonah knew God's Word. There, there wasn't a misunderstanding. I didn't hear it right. No, he knew it. It was clear. And he was commanded to do it. But he thought he knew better. He thought he knew better. And so he couldn't follow wholeheartedly. And then that leads to backsliding. It always does when we ignore God's Word and we go our own way. So last point, God's Word is ignored. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now think about this again. It was crystal clear. Go to Nineveh. That was 500 miles. It was a three-month trip northeast. And Jonah chooses Tarshish, 2,000 miles southwest, a year-long trip. He wanted to get as far away from God as he could, as possible. Now, I don't think Jonah was thinking, again, spiritually trained. He knew doctrine. He knew theology. He wasn't thinking that he could get out of God's sight, as a lot of people think. No, he, he wasn't. He knew better than that. He was running away from God's assignment. And what he thought was, if God... If God would let me just go and I'll get far enough away, then he'll send another prophet, someone that maybe will agree with him, someone that doesn't mind losing their reputation. And so he fled, it says, from God's presence. And what does that mean? You can't ever get out of God's presence. 
God's always there. He's omnipresent. What this means is He fled from God's felt presence. And any time we ignore God's will, we lose God's felt presence in our life. That's what happens. We quench the Spirit when we backslide. And I think we need to ask ourselves, are we living in obedience right now in our life? Are we going through the motions? Are we really walking with God in obedience in every area of our life? Or could you be running from God's assignment for you? It's easy to do. doesn't matter how privileged you are. We can do that. Or do you sense His comforting presence? Do you sense God's felt presence in your life? Do you feel His peace in your life? Privileged Jonah chose to leave it by ignoring God's Word. And he's going to find out that just as we do, when we ignore God's Word in disobedience to God, He never lets us get away with it. I don't know why we can't get that through our brains. I want you to know something else. Every step out of God's will is a step downward. Do you know that? When we backslide, we go downward one step at a time. Someone said so rightly, there's no blowouts in the Christian life. There's no blowouts in the Christian life. It's one step at a time downward. J.C. Ross said, men fall in private long before they fall in public. And so look at verse 3. He leaves the presence of the, God, of the Lord. He leaves the presence of the Lord. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? When we get out of the Word, we leave the presence of the Lord, the felt presence, don't we? That's what happens. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship which was going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare, and he went down into it with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Pay attention. Look, what's his first step? He went down to Joppa. You see that? And he found a ship and he paid the fare. Look, he went down into the ship. You see that? Then in verse 15, look over there. And they picked up Jonah and they, they threw him into the sea. We can say he went down into the sea. Down to Joppa, down in the ship, down into the sea. Down, 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 running from God, disobeying Him. Verse 17, Lord appeared, prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish. And we can certainly say then he went down into the stomach of the great fish. And we can certainly say down in the stomach of the great fish. And then in chapter 2, verse 3, he's cast into the deep. That's down into the deep. And so think about this. Every time we disobey God and we run from His Word, we go down, 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 down to Joppa, down, to the sh down in the ship, down in the sea, down in the fish's stomach, down into the deep. Five dramatic steps downward. Painful, horrific, horrible, scary. Am I going to die? What's He doing? I think if we were to meet Jonah now, he'd say it wasn't worth it. Dr. Barnhouse, I love him. He points out in the message that Jonah paid the fare. He went on to observe that Jonah didn't get to where he was going because he was thrown overboard. Obviously, he didn't get a refund on his ticket. He never made it to Tarshish. So he paid the full fare, but he never made it to where he was going. And Barnhouse goes on to say, it's always the way. When we run away from the Lord, we always pay the fare. We never get to where we're going, but we have to pay. On the other hand, when you follow the Lord's way, you always get to where you're going, and He pays the fare. I love that. Let me say it again. When you run away from the Lord, you never get to where you're going and you always pay your own fare. But on the other hand, when you go the Lord's way, you always get to where you're going and He pays the fare. So Jonah illustrates for us what happens when we drift. 
when we backslide, even when we're privileged, we wrestle with God, we try to go our own way, we get nothing but heartache and pain. And we never get what we want. There's never a safe spot away from God's presence. Martin Luther wrote this. He said, not only the ship, but the whole world becomes too small for Jonah. He finds no nook or corner in all of creation, not even in hell, where he can crawl into. But he must expose himself <clears throat> to the gaze of all the creatures and stand before them in public shame. <clears throat> and so that's the picture of Jonah. No one, none of us, can escape God's eye and His presence even if we choose to live disobediently. Spurgeon says the Christian life is like, is like climbing a hill of ice, isn't it? You can't slide up. You have to work at it. You have to cut every step into the axe with a continuous effort of cutting and chipping to make progress. But it's easy to backslide. It's easy to quit going forward and cease going forward. So the point is, we can never stand still, even if God has privileged you in your Christian life. We cannot rest on the past. Dr. Joint, Dr. Johnson makes another interesting point. I, I got to bring this up. I, God's always providential. God has His providence, but Satan has His providence too. Did you know there's such a thing as satanic providences? And, and in those circumstances, Satan can arrange favorable terms, favorable circumstances that are not God's will. Think about it. Jonah went down to Tarshish and there was a ship there. And not only was there a ship there, but there was a availability for him to get on that ship. Not only was there availability for him to get on that ship, but he had the money to get on that ship. And oftentimes when we disobey, we can rationalize that we know the right way because Satan will egg it on by setting the circumstances in a satanic providence to say, yes, see, this works, this works, this works. Keep going. This is what God wants you to do. And so he could have easily reasoned, uh, God wants me to do this. All the circumstances are provided perfectly for me to meet my own desires. And Satan will order circumstances in your life to deceive you. I've heard men say, you know, I met this beautiful woman. I never loved my wife. I shouldn't have ever married her. And it just so happens that this woman is in my office or she's in my life. And this is what God wants me to do. That's satanic providence. And how do we stay away from that? By we follow the Word of God. We trust the Word of God. We don't waver from the Word of God. There's never God's will that's contrary to God's Word. Well, let me close by saying this. There are many in this class who have been privileged in their spiritual life. It could have started in your childhood. It could have started several years ago. But if you're here in this church and God has granted you an understanding of truth and an appetite to love His Word, then you are spiritually privileged just like Jonah. You are. And Jonah gives us a great warning about leaving God's will. It, he, he was not in the will of God because he drifted out of the Word of God and the presence of God. And when we drift out of the Word of God and the presence of God, guess what? We always lose our peace. You want to know if you're out of the will of God? Are you peaceful? Are you joyful? See, one great lesson for us is like Jonah, we're never going to find happiness running from God. There, there, will, there will be inside a believer's life consternation, like me in college. I mean... I was chaplain of the fraternity. But I was not walking with God. I was chasing what I wanted. Everyone thought I was a successful Christian. But I was not in the felt presence of God obeying His Word. So if you're in the middle of the will of God, then you'll have peace. If you're living 
in the presence of God, no matter your circumstances, you'll rise above the circumstances with peace and joy. See, that's what Jonah ignored, the Word of God. And it's so easy. And the reason it resonates with me is that, is that, is that he had every answer and knew what to do, and he ignored it, just like all of us. And that's the warning to us, isn't it? Isn't it? I'll leave you with this verse, Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. That's what Jonah's life teaches us, doesn't it? To know this word of truth, not only to know it, but to listen to its commands and to obey it. God's going to test you in, in, the, in what's most important in your life. And He's going to say, are you going to follow my word? Or are you going to follow your feelings, your reasoning, and what you want? And lastly, we need to commit to say, Lord, I want to obey your truth no matter what. I don't want to backslide. I don't want to run. I don't want to fall. I don't want to be like Jonah. I don't want to suffer these serious consequences because I cannot get out of your presence ever. What good does it do to me? Help me follow you. Help me walk with you. What areas in my life now am I drifting? What areas in my life am I not fully committed? Lord, show me right now. I want to clean it up. I want to erase it because I, if Jonah can do it, a prophet from God, I certainly can't, right? So praise God for Jonah's life. It's going to get even better next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your servant Jonah and the picture of, of his life and the picture that it illustrates for us that we are so easily lured by the world and our own reasoning and not to follow you. It's so easy to do. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us a greater desire to love you, to follow you, to walk with you, to share your, uh, your truth, and to grow in a deeper way, deeper, Father, than we've ever been, in a closer walk, in a greater peace, in a deeper joy than we've ever had. Help us, Father, to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.